School of Rock. Santa Ana. Well, hi, my name's Nathan Ward. I grew up in a small little farming town in Tremont, in Utah. I'm the youngest of seven kids. Wow. Dad, dad was a band director. All of us play musical instruments. Uh, my dad wanted a family band, so when I come around, the only thing that was left, he needed a rhythm section, so he said, you're going to play guitar. <laughs> nice. and you would think that's really cool and all but i never really took to it uh, so when i got in middle school my dad had a french horn laying around so i picked up the french horn it came really easy to me and uh, so that's how i i picked up the french horn i went to college didn't do so hot in college so i joined the navy <laughs> and i actually joined the navy to be on a sub but then i uh, met my my wife and she's like no you should go take an audition with the navy band because i had three other brothers in the navy hmm. so i did that i took an audition got in the navy and my first my first tour in newport rhode island they uh, the navy just started a brand new like sound sound reinforcement course and they're like hmm. hey anybody want to go to it i'm yeah. like yeah sure i'm tired of playing in the bq i want to be in the big band <laughs> with my me brothers up. yeah so I, I went to the sound course. I learned how to do live sound hmm. and then the rest is history. And I've been, I've been in the Navy for about 16 years now and been running sound for about 13 of those 16 years. And I've cool. loved every minute of it. Nice, man. If you could go back and uh, start over, would you start the sound stuff sooner? I mean, you seem really passionate about it. It seemed like you like it. Yeah. Well, and I've always loved uh electronics mm, and gear. yeah i remember when i was younger my dad i'd always tear into my my dad's uh audio home entertainment system receivers and it wasn't working i'd tear into it look at see if i could fix it and i'd get yeah. it fixing so i've always been a very technological minded yeah but yeah the sound i've always said like i like my french horn but i love sound i yeah. just i'm very passionate about running live sound and there's nothing greater when you're mixing a band and people in the audience come out and say man that is a great sounding band that's awesome i'm like yeah. dude that that's sweet yeah and that's the that's the bee's knees that's the bee's knees man that's the most important role in the band i mean you can have the best players uh on stage anywhere man the best musicians you can think of but if you can't hear them if the audience can't hear what they're playing and what they're performing there's no way to really appreciate that. Music is auditory. You have to be able to hear it. So to have a good sound guy, that's definitely the most important person in the band, man. No question about it. And uh, you are a fine example of that, my friend. I tend to agree. I would think you would, well, man. Well, I, I tend to agree. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you would, man. Yeah, absolutely. So for your sound education, it started mostly like your formal sort of sound training started in the Navy, that program there. Yes. And what was that yeah, like? It what started in, well, it started in 2006. And when I went through the sound course, we were still being taught on analog gear. So okay. I learned a lot of my stuff on a, on an analog gear. And at that time in 2004, I believe the Navy had just bought its first digital boards. It was the yeah. Yamaha O2R and the O1V. Okay. And those are if you've ever <laughs> if anybody's ever worked on those boards they're great but mm. you know those first iterations they were there was a <laughs> steep learning curve uh, how so what was what were some but of the then, things that made it more difficult what, what made it so difficult well there was a lot of pages trying to navigate yourself through all the different layers of mm. pages on that console because Again, with analog consoles, everything's just laid out for you. You've got, mm. you know, if it's a 24 channel mixing console, your EQ section, your auxes, everything is just completely let out on that single strip and you can see everything that's happening on an analog board. So it's pretty gotcha. easy. And then you've got all your, your rack, your outboard, your, you know, your EQs, your reverbs, all that stuff. It's all on an external rack. Okay. So it's very easy to see, do, mm. but with the O2Rs, it's just, it's changing your mindset of how you look and how you see, and then trying to navigate 
through all those layers of okay where do i get to my augs mixes where do i get uh, to my buses and gotcha okay now i don't have i don't have outboard effects units now i've got all my effects are internal so how do i navigate through all that stuff and mm. you know and at that time you know i think yamaha you know they were experimenting like okay this is our first digital board so how are we going to navigate all this stuff and okay. throughout the years they've just made better improvements and currently the Navy's mixing on a CL, a CL, the CL series, whether it's the CL one, the okay. three or the five. Still and Yamaha. That board, that's, that's still that a Yamaha like brand. Awesome. Okay. And that's still a Yamaha brand. Yes. Okay. So they went from the O series to the C series. What changed on that kind of stuff? What, what's the, some of the main differences? Um, well, one of the main differences is the CL series. You don't have a lot of, head amps on the back of the console like you do analog boards or even yeah. like the O one series they had all their head amps on the back of that console okay but now with the cl series they're using stage boxes that link up through the dante network ah. so you can have like multiple basically the stage boxes are like um your sub snakes Okay. And so you're using those and then you're linking them together through a network switch which Yamaha runs the Dante network okay. and then all those signals, all those head amps are all coming in through that cat six cable coming into gotcha. your console. That way you don't have to have anything basically plugged into the back of your console. Oh. And then, yeah. And then instead of having a big thick snake yeah. <laughs> running to your console, right. it's just a single little cat digital six cable. cable. Yeah. And for people that don't know about what sub snakes are and that kind of stuff, it's, uh, can you explain that a little bit, like how those inputs work and what that is? Yeah. So a sub snake, it basically allows you on stage to run shorter microphone cables. Mm. You would back in the old days of analog, you would have a, you would have a, um, a snake where you would have like 32 channels where all your microphone cables plugged into this center hub. Okay you know so all your microphones are coming here and then instead of if you're on a huge stage let's say you got a 50 foot wide stage hmm. you don't want to be running 50 foot microphone cables all sure. over the place so yeah. you would just have a little a, like a 12 channel sub snake that would be on your stage left and then all your microphones would plug into there and then those that one little cable would want run to your main snake Gotcha. And then you would have, so you could have multiple sub snakes on stage that run into the main, main snake that runs to your, uh, gotcha. run to your console. It helps to clean up the stage a little bit, I guess. And it probably shortens, you know, the amount of cabling you need to use, which, which probably improves your sound, right? The, the length of cable you lo you use can degrade your sound, right? Yeah. At a certain point. And again, sure. you know, maybe like if you're, and for the Navy, we would never really run and play on big stages. But, mm. you know, you think about some of these big zacks and some of these outdoor big venues yeah. like Red Rocks in California sure. or in Colorado. Yeah. And, you know, some of these stages are huge. Right. You know, right. So you'd, you'd be running big, long runs of cable. And it, yeah. it just helps clean up your stage. And now with the digital age, yeah. it's just nice to have, again, like – you may have a stage box that's like 32 channels in 24 out, mm. but then you can have smaller versions like a, just an eight channel in or a 16 channel eight out where you can have that by your drums, you know, depending on how many microphones you're putting on your drums. I've seen, you know, some drummers use eight microphones on their drums and I've seen yeah. them use maybe 12 or 13 microphones on your drums. Gotcha. And then, again with the digital age they have that set up by the drums and then it's all connected through just a cat six cable that runs into a switch on stage and yeah. then that runs out and right into your console it's, that's awesome. it's pretty sweet yeah that's cool and what we're talking about basically right now is live sound stuff right because it does change a little bit yes. for recording sound right for for having a recording studio or recording how would that change or what ki kinds of things change versus the ins and outs and that kind of mechanical stuff what what's different about live sound versus you know studio sound well live 
the concepts are the same, you know, whatever you apply in the studio, like EQ or compressors or gates that mm. can transfer over to live audio pretty nicely. But okay. I think where studio changes from live is you don't have to have as much, um, like you're not going to have big line arrays in a studio. So sure. some of the gear changes, mm. uh, in the studio, you're going to be using an interface Okay. So you're you're still going to be using microphones. You're still going to be using a mixing console. Mm. Uh, you're still going to be using you know head amps. Okay. You know a stage box, especially if you have a separate like mixing room, mm. uh, and then walled off. You're still going to want. You still got to have a way to get the microphone signal from where your musicians are sure. into you. Right. So that, that stuff really doesn't change, but recording, and you don't need to be as careful in a studio than you do in live sound. Like hmm. you can, you can crank your head amp games. You really don't really need to pay too much attention to gain structure in a studio because okay. you have, you're not using monitors. You know what yeah. I'm saying? All okay. you're doing is taking that recorded sound, bringing it into a DAW, yeah. and then you're monitoring that level. Like if you want to crank that gain up to get a really strong signal mm. in a studio, that's you know you don't want to get it to the point where you clip and degrade sure. the signal. Okay. You can still have it pretty hot, but if you do that in a live setting, you run the chance of feedback, especially if you're using stage monitors. Mm. so you see you have to pay a little more close attention in live sound to your gain structure okay and what yeah what you're doing and you cool can you walk me through a little bit so i was talking with uh smo actually the other day i had him on uh the program he was our first uh, we talked about bass and stuff and i've since had a couple um sit downs with him that we'll post later about compression and he's working on some home recording stuff so i do have a couple questions uh, specifically targeted for him that he wanted me to ask you uh, on this uh, episode <laughs> about uh, some of the home recording stuff. And I, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but just to, to kick off that. And we talked about, so you mentioned a couple of things, head amp, and you mentioned gain structure. And we had talked, uh, Smo and I, about gain structure and what that means and what are the different things that make up gain structure. Can you just go through what, you know, what a head amp is, how you get the sound in, what is gain structure and, and what constitutes gain structure? How does, how does that work? So you're, so in the, in signal flow, in audio signal flow is with, with audio engineers where you have to know where your signal is coming in. So in audio, you have three different types of levels. You got mic level, line level and speaker level mm -hmm. and when an acoustic sound like my voice if a microphone is recording my voice it's converting that audio signal or that analog signal into a digital or a a voltage oh yeah and, okay. and so when we're talking like microphone level we're talking about a very voltage because that's mm. all it is it's it's converting that signal into like zeros and ones it's oh. just a certain voltage that you're at and what the head amp gain does on your console is you're boosting that voltage that's probably like here mm. and boosting it to here to a workable level I see. where you we can start manipulating the signal we can start adding eq we can start doing mm. like compression um so you're talking about voltage effect anything you can do that we hear sound we need to yeah. get it at a certain voltage okay. and that's that's what that's what the head amp gain does is it takes your little bit of microphone i'm trying to talk very lame yeah no that's perfect man <laughs> not absolutely to, not, not technical terms here but yeah absolutely you're, you're taking that at a very small voltage level and boosting it to here gotcha. and that's where that's the workable range that we want to be at that makes sense and voltage you're talking about really actually like electricity it's converting it to some sort of electrical signal yeah that that's all it is okay. and yeah because our our the microphone is it's a it's an input transducer okay you know, it's it's um what does that uh, mean? Yeah, what is Don't that? forget about that. It's getting what too, is, we're getting too technical. What is a transducer anyway? What does that do? Yeah. Man. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. No, you don't need. Basically, all it is is it's converting uh, an 
an analog, not an analog signal. It's taking an acoustic mm. sound and converting it to electricity. That's yeah. all a, a transducer is. So I you see. got an input transducer and an output transducer. Input transducer is like a microphone. Output transducer is a speaker. Oh, okay. the, speaker, the speaker is taking that electricity, that voltage, and converting it back to an acoustic sound. Sound. Interesting. So it basically takes... So the input transducer, if I understand this correctly, would take my voice into this microphone and it translates the wave vibrations into some voltage signal. And the mm -hmm. output transducer would be opposite. It would take that voltage signal and translate that into some vibrating speaker or something that would create an audio signal. Yeah, and 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 the, and the whole speaker design, you know, you've got... Anyway, that's getting too technical. We don't need to get into that. <laughs> that's all right. Well, we'll do another one and we'll definitely yeah, have that's, you. That's, that's the science behind sound. That's more for the workshop. For, that's a little more for the short term of it. That's, yeah. that's what, a, that's what a, um, the head amps are doing. You're boosting, you're boosting that voltage okay. into, into a workable range. Like, you know, what you're doing, your microphone right there, mm -hmm. it's hurting your voice and then it's bringing it into your DAW. Yeah. Where, you know, and you're setting that gain to where it's at a workable level that you can work with. You got it. And DAW, for those who don't know, a digital audio workstation, there are many different types. It's basically just means something that you're recording your signal into. And when you're talking about a workable range, what is it that you're looking for in that gain structure? What makes it usable or not usable? Uh, well, you want it. Well, one, you don't want it to be too soft and okay. you don't want it to be too loud. So as that signal comes into your your software program, your DAW, whether that's Pro Tools or Logic Pro X, uh, Nuendo, Studio One, there's a bunch sure. of them out there. Yeah. Reaper, I think that's a free one. You know. Yeah. Anyway, you you want to basically you want to look at that meter, and if that meter is showing, you know, kind of kissing the yellow orange not like if you turn it way too hot and it's peaking that red mm. and you can hear an audible distortion yeah you know the the term we use for that is clipping then that's okay. you've you've boosted that head amp way too much you need to back that off so you want to keep it in like i don't want to get you know there's a like there's some numbers that that's the workable range of the voltage but okay yeah, it's important. That's important stuff, man. We want to know keep... how to get a functional audio signal. You know, we want to, we want uh, kids and people watching this, parents, anybody that's interested in audio to be able to um, have a basic understanding. What we're trying to talk about is just a basic understanding of what a good workable signal would be because, and even talking to Smo last week, that's why we got into gain structure because, you know, he's like, oh, well, I see it in my waveform and, and where we sort of got, he was like, my waveform is like, you know, I, I see it, it has these nice peaks and it's, it's pretty solid. You know, I'm like the waveform kind of lies, you know, like it doesn't necessarily tell you if there's clipping in there or not. It doesn't necessarily tell you if, you know, if you have distortion in a signal or if you have a clean guitar, for instance, I play guitar. Uh, so I know a lot about that. A distorted guitar, clean guitar, you won't really be able to see the difference in a waveform. It doesn't tell you what right. the sound is. So you could still have distortion in that wave sound. You could still have a not very pleasant sound and yet the waveform would look nice and so that's where we started talking about gain structure because you know you're setting gain structure in a few different segments right you're setting it at your amp head or whatever you're using to power that you're setting it then on whatever input you use on your DAW or your board or your whatever it is and then you're setting a structure with any in like plugins or anything that you're putting on it as well so and that, and that brings me to like so like the bass so like smo's bass mm -hmm. him so he has a, a head amp on his or a preamp mm -hmm. on his uh, on his you know amp head. So he's adjusting that level because his pickups that's a input transducer. Those inputs sure. on his bass. Okay. So he has to adjust that gain to get it to. And, and what he's doing is he's taking that basically mic level, that voltage from his bass, mm. what those little pickups are doing, and same thing on your guitar, mm. it's getting it to line level. So then when it comes into the console, that signal is already pretty much at at line level. Like okay. like when when we I was mixing you guys in the band, I didn't have to do too much to your guitar and bass because it was already 
pretty much coming in at a pretty good level. Okay. Now you may ask what a good level is mm. on your DAW. You know, when you see your faders, there's numbers there okay. and zero, you want to get that signal to zero. And in audio, we call that nominal. So if you can okay. get your head, you want to adjust your head amp to where that signal starts hitting at nominal. Okay. And when you can get that, so basically you're seeing your meter hit. And when you see it hit zero, that's, that's a pretty you're, strong you're pretty signal. Good. That's pretty good. That's where okay. you want it. Cool. That's the information. Smo's looking for. I know he's going to watch this episode, and he's going to be like, "Man, be taking notes and trying to figure out exactly what, what he's what he's supposed to do there." You know, because that's a that's a thing that eludes a lot of people. I mean, it's not just. I mean, Smo is a professional musician. We all are, and what you do, the sound aspect, is completely different, and it's and it's a very valuable part of the whole project of the whole uh, performance. But it's a very different role from a musician. So then you have someone like Smo or some of the kids. Um, or parents or students at home that want to record stuff for YouTube or Twitch or, you know, wherever they're streaming or wherever they're going to put their uh, sound, wherever they want to get that out and understanding the fundamentals of, Hey, yeah, I could be a fantastic player. I could be really good at my instrument, but recording that, putting that in the box, trying to get that in a way to, to share with other people. Um, that's a totally different science. It's a totally different skill. And it's one that I love a lot. You and I have had lots of conversations about, uh, you know, recording audio and stuff. I have more experience uh, maybe in the recording studio than I do live. Um, so I have, a you know, more experience on that end. Uh, but they're very similar, like you mentioned before. You know, there's a lot of things that, that translate on both sides. And that's something I want to provide our students as well is the ability to have at least a basic recording. And then, and then from there, they can learn, you know, how EQ works and how gain structure works. And Smo and I talked about compression. There's going to be an episode on that and, you know, how that works and functions and all of those effects and stuff. But it starts with, and I emphasize this again uh, to Smo, and it's getting a good level. You have to have, if you record yeah, audio absolutely. that's trash, there's no amount of effects that you can, it's like, what can you do to it? It's already, you know, I recorded it at, it's too hot or it's too quiet or it's whatever. I mean, too quiet is often at least somewhat correctable, but if you're getting too hot, if it's clipping, if it's already distorting by the time you get it into the box, there's nothing you can do with that. So it starts with that gain structure. It starts with getting that level right so that you get a clean sound that is representative of what that person is playing regardless of necessarily the the level it should be a good solid level as you mentioned nominal that's that's a great tip that's awesome um that's what we're sort of looking for and then uh in addition to that you just want it to be the representative of the sound that they have right yeah absolutely i've um that, that's the whole point with live sound you know why do i want to take a sound that a musician has spent hours and hours creating and mm. perfected. Yeah. And why am I going to change it or destroy that sound? My job in live sound is to reinforce that sound. Mm. Now, if I want to put a cool effect on something, I'm going to still go talk to the musician and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, I've got yeah. a really cool phaser effect that at this moment in time, what do you think? Do you think that's cool? Like I'm yeah. still communicating with my musicians yeah. and getting their opinion. And if they're like, no, no, I don't like that. Or I've got this effect on my pedal board. I'll do that. Like, oh, okay. I love guitar. I love guitar players. Cause it's easy. You got everything. Yeah. They've right. got all their effects. They got <laughs> sure. all their tricks and toys that they do on their feet. Sure. And yeah. So it's easy for me. All I'm doing is just reinforcing their sound and making sure that what yeah. they give me is truly representative coming through the speakers. Because right. again, when, you know, we're talking about input transducers and even output transducers, the 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 conversion of that signal it kind of gets degraded like mm. you know microphones if i'm going to microphone your amp mm -hmm. sure i try and put a mic on there that's going to be truly representative of it but every mic has a different frequency response sure. which means at somewhere in the audio spectrum there's either a bump a boost or a cut of where that mm. microphone is picking yeah. up so you have to be aware of that. And so as it comes, as that signal comes into you through the mixing console, you got to realize, okay, that's kind of colored his guitar sound. So now yeah. maybe I need to, I need to, where that boost was maybe in the 4K range, four kilohertz. Yeah. I need to cut that on my end and then make sure the compressor 
you know, again, if I'm using all that stuff and that's, that's where like live sound, you have to be really aware of that stuff. And even in the studio too, you just got to realize that, you know, there's some entry level mics. Like I've, I've heard an engineer say that he can take a hundred dollar mic and make it sound like a Neumann. Sure. The U87s you know, five, five, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. A, a Neumann yeah. $5,000 mic. Yeah. It just takes a little bit of EQing, a little bit of tweaking. Yeah. To get it. You know what I'm saying? So, absolutely. you know, that, that's another thing between the live and the studio where it translates both of them. You still have to be aware of what gear you're using and yeah. understanding of how to maybe combat some of those issues that yeah. using that gear or what it does to the sound i like because, that yeah, concept. but it is gonna it is gonna color the sound absolutely i like that concept of sound reinforcement instead of you know sound engineering is really great but it gives this connotation that you are somehow creating or um you know altering or doing something to the sound which is very important if it's necessary but right. i think the reinforcement piece needs to come first and should be just like you're mentioning primary expectation is that this person knows their sound has developed their sound their voice their guitar their piano oboe violin whatever it is they've perfected or understood their sound such that i need to basically take that and make sure we are truly representing that to the audience or to whoever's listening you know right so what what can i do as a musician when I go to a venue, which often has, you know, supplied sound or there's, you know, there's a, there's a sound person or a sound guy there um, who may or may not have been, you know, jaded from the last hundred bands that came through and never listened to him and never did what he suggested, he or she suggested. And, um, you know, what, what can I do as a musician going into a venue where there's someone I don't know running a soundboard? Uh, how can I set myself up for success to build a good rapport with them and to, to help them want to mix my sound well? Well, I think if you, um, yeah, man, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank us, you. Our, us sound guys, man, we're the grumpiest people on earth. <laughs> well, a little bit. You know what? I think, uh, I think one thing you can do is when you come in and the sound guy's trying to get, you know, your, your band is coming in and don't noodle. Mm. let let the sound guy get the stuff set up for you yeah and then let him if you are gonna noodle then just turn your guitar off and and do that or something but don't because there's nothing mm -hmm. more annoying when mm -hmm. you're trying to get things hooked up you're trying to get things plugged in and someone's just wailing away on that guitar really loud or, yeah. or bass or drums drummers are the worst sure well because it's acoustic right everything you they do you pick up in every mic on stage right i mean everything is picking so, that signal up I, yeah. and then again that's that's probably the main thing just wait until the, your sound guy says okay hey guitar let's get you let's get a signal on you you yeah. Know, start playing your guitar, and then also too, when the sound guy says, "Okay, I want to do a sound check," give him your loudest. Okay. You know, play whatever you're. You know, think of the set that you're going to be playing. Whatever you're going to be giving him, that's the loudest. Give him that. You know, okay. clean. Yeah. Give him a nice strong signal, and then just let him know. Just say, "Hey, that's the loudest I'm going to be. That's the loudest portion." Gotcha. And then give him, give him your, uh, your distortion, or right. you know, if you're going to use it like a dirty pedal or whatever. Yeah. Give him that, and 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 usually as a guitar player too, we sound guys we really love when all your signals are balanced out. So when uh, you hit something, when you go to a different patch, yeah it's the same as your other one. Your clean is this level, your distortion within like maybe three, three or de three decibels above or below. Gotcha. If it's within that range, yeah, man, we will be your best friend forever. <laughs> That's the bane of the sound guys sort of existence in my experiences, because, you know, guitar players and especially when you're younger and starting out, you don't have, you're not used to a lot of sound reinforcement. I mean, when I was starting out playing, you know, small groups and I mean, I started in the church where they do have sound reinforcement when I was playing out around town in bars and clubs and stuff, 
you really only have your amp, you know, you're not really doing a lot of sound reinforcement. So, you know, when I kick on my solo pedal, it's twice as loud or more than, than right. my rhythm sound, because that's what I'm used to. And that's the way that I uh, have learned to play. It's my habit, you know? So when you do have sound reinforcement, and one of the things that I learned uh, from you and from other sound guys that I've played with that are very aware of the sound and very uh, quick to react and able to react to that stuff is that you want to give them the most control over your sound. You want to make sure the tone is true to your tone because sometimes the level that you increase on the amplifiers is, is, is part of the sound. It's part of the tone. Right. But being aware that if you do have a sound guy that's conscious of that and paying attention and is good sound reinforcement um, guy, person, individual, they're going to be able to make you sound great out front. And as long as you can hear yourself and it sounds true to your sound, like in your in-ears or in the monitors or how, however you're listening to it, give them the ability to mix that at a, at a good level. So when you kick on that pedal, you're not just destroying the audience or turning them off. Cause that's, you know, the reality is it's like, it does upset the sound guy. You know, it sort of is annoying, but the reality is you're also alienating a lot of your audience, right? Because when that sound comes on and the sound guy will do his or her best to adjust that sound, you know, like grab that fader real quick, but you've already blasted the ears of your audience, you know, so you're not just upsetting the sound guy. The reason it's upsetting to him is because him or her is because the balance is now off. Right. And they, they, you, you as the sound person want that to be, even you want to give the best representation of the band. And you can't do that if someone is standing out too much. And now you've alienated the audience a little bit because they're like, ah, it's like that feedback sound you hear, you know, and everybody's like, but it's that same effect. You know, you get too loud, you get too sharp in people's ears and, and they're like, eh. and then they don't trust the band, right? They don't trust the sound person. They're like, eh, that's going to happen again. I'm out of here, you know, and it makes it unlistenable. You want it to be easy to listen to. And the best way to do that is to provide an even level. Yeah. And, and honestly, if you've never, if a player, a musician has never worked with a live sound person before, you could even just go up and just be honest with the sound guy say yeah. hey look i have never i've always played in bars i've always relied on my amp sound yeah my pedal boards okay you know and, and just talk if you can if you can get a sure. hold of them if they're not sure. back in the backstage running around like crazy yeah sure you know, well if they're not yeah, yeah taking a drink and being doing whatever who knows world. right but if yeah. you can if you can get a hold of your of a sound guy and even if you could get a hold of the like the venue or if mm -hmm. your band if you're in the band if say hey who's running sound i just want to talk to them and and just be honest to say look i've never had this experience i've never worked with a thing yeah. what do you want from me okay and they'll tell you just say hey before you come to the gig for me i would say if someone did that for me i'd be like hey just balance out your signals yeah like all your patches if you can balance them out as close as possible that would help me out a ton okay you know you know if and then i would say do you want to run direct to me or do you really need your amp okay and then i'd I, you know what i would ask what model amp are you using hmm. You know, because if I know your amp has tubes in it, I know those tube amps have to be cranked pretty hot. Right. To get them sounding right. So I would tell you, okay, well, the type of amp you're using, you're going to have to put a lot of sound through it. Right. So I would either suggest bringing a, like a tilt stand to put your amp so it's facing you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or turn it to the side, blow it to the side of the stage right. or turn it completely around. You know, that... And, th and those are little tricks that you can use so that the sound guy can still balance out the sound. That's a great point. Communication is always really important in a band with your sound engineer, with the venue, with anybody just communicating. Here's my sound. Here's what I'm thinking and being honest about that stuff. I've never been in the studio before. I've never been in a situation where I had a sound reinforcement person before. I've never had this experience. Help me out. And you'll find uh, as curmudgeonly as they can be, most sound <laughs> engineers will react positively to that because most people don't do that. Most people go in there, they uh, shoehorn their sound in there. They try to just stuff the square peg in the round hole and are not conscious of how that affects the venue, how that affects, I mean, you're talking to a sound person that probably mixes at that venue all the time. That's their well, full-time job. They know, they know, they know it. Venue. They know what sound they're looking for. They know what you want to hear. And that's how you're going to sound good because the reality is 
just like I said at the beginning, you can be the best musician in the world, which most of us are not, right? We're wherever we're at, right? You could be the best musician in the world. If it doesn't sound good out front, no one's going to want to listen to that. And conversely, you can be, you know, a pretty decent middle of the road or, or above average musician. If it sounds good out front, it's phenomenally, uh, um, exponentially increases your listenability to the audience. You can, people that can listen to it and enjoy that sound. They're not going to remember the 16th note run at 220 that you're shredding out, you know, like they're not going to remember that specific moment. What they're going to remember is the overall impression that your band or your act or your solo guitar or whatever it is left on them. And that can only be true to the sound if you're in line with the sound engineer with your band and you're all communicating and making sure that the experience is true to what it is that your experience is supposed to be you know yeah absolutely so that's awesome information especially for people starting out because we get an entry an, an entry into how to communicate with the sound guy and how to communicate with our band and how to you know present our sound on stage uh, I want to ask a little bit about some of the larger venues and larger uh, audience sound reinforcement experiences. So on a large stage, they have what I've kind of come to refer to as like noiseless stages. I don't know how the professionals in the business, you can tell me, you know, but that kind of thing. So when I'm looking at a huge stage like Justin Timberlake stage or, you know, Beyonce stage or something, the experience out in front is not the same as the experience that's going on on stage. So what's happening there and how are they achieving that? Like what's going on in those large venues that what would the experience be like if I was on stage listening to that? Would I hear any sound at all? How would that go? Um, well, I think, I think a lot of these musicians are going to in-ears. Mm. And so, yeah, I think a lot of, if you'll notice a lot of these musicians have, in ears yeah, in their ears absolutely. and that's how they're receiving their that's how they're receiving their signal okay. and it's it's super quiet or i you know i really can't speak i really don't know okay honestly but i would think as i've seen some of these big venues you see that stage monitors are still all around the yeah, stage yeah i don't think they're on yeah, they doesn't seem they're, like they're using they're, they're them. They're there for emergency, but it's almost yeah. there for a look. Right. That's what you expect to see when you go to a show. You expect to see that. But I noticed that too. The in ear. So when you're talking about in ears, you're talking about in ear monitor systems. In ear monitor systems, and then you have a separate guy on stage who is mixing those for each of those musicians that we call. A, um, you've got a front of house engineer, and then you have a an. Um, monitor engineer who's hmm. off the side of the stage who's controlling every musician's mixes okay and so you kind of ask that person and it works the same with monitors i imagine but with the in-ears you're asking that person you know i need a vocals up or guitar up or i want to hear more drums mm -hmm. or whatever it is and then they'll yeah, they're able they, to mix uh, anything they're they're and they're it's very different being a monitor engineer than a, a front of house that's a whole different world. Oh, how, <laughs> a, how so those, what are some those, of the differences well those guys are they well they have to one they have to be super quick like if you know like some some people like vocalists they really want to have reverb in okay. their in ears so they you have to know okay yeah i want this effect i gotta learn how to route this back into their in ears mm. Um, a lot of, a lot of these bands, you'll notice these big acts and big stages when they play live, it sounds like the CD. Yeah, sure. But you, but you only notice there's only like maybe four or five musicians on stage right? and how they're accomplishing that is backing tracks. Okay. They'll take all those stems that they've recorded and then they play back and then in their ears, the band will play to a click track. Mm. and so then you get this full full sound coming out front interesting as far as like how what it would sound like on stage i don't know if you're if you're not used to in-ears it would probably probably be a little different mm. for you but you know if you're used to in-ears it'd probably be the same thing there's in-ears that are so good they give you that same like you know, if you have an amp behind you and you yeah. feel all that air right. push against you, they still give you that feeling. That's interesting. Cause that is what you kind of miss. And 
I've used in ears mm. and monitors, and what you miss immediately from the in ears is the sound, like waves hitting you, like the actual physical sound. You don't realize that that that's part of the experience. You don't realize that that's part of being on stage. But the amps are pushing air, the bass amp and the guitar amp, and it's all pushing air. The monitors are pushing air towards you, and you get this feeling on stage of all of that air moving around. And when you put in the in ears, although the same sounds are there that feeling is different you know it doesn't feel very well and see and and going to live sound that's a very that's something i've always uh considered for my musicians because i when i was taught sound my teacher at the time was like okay is this about you Mm. or is it about your musicians because if your musicians are comfortable on stage and they're happy then your job's going to be so much more easier out front mixing so i've always tried to to make sure my musicians that i'm mixing for are comfortable and if that means they want to feel like those sub waveforms uh hitting them on stage then that's what i'm going to give them because you know in audio there's this thing that we can do with the subs where you put one sub in front of another and then you delay the sub back and it cancels out all the low frequencies on stage, ah. which is really cool for sound engineers because that gives us more control. There's less bleed of the low frequencies okay. going through all the microphones on stage. Yeah. We lower the stage noise, which is really cool. But what you're doing is you're taking away that feeling from the musicians, that yeah. kind of that, that yeah, thump sure, that they yeah. get from the stage. Yeah. So some, you just, you know you just have to know some bands they want that thump and so you kind of have to cater to that yeah and then you have to make your adjustments so if that's the case then i'm probably going to be using a lot more gates on my microphones on stage Mm. to cancel out those low frequencies gotcha yeah i would love to do a whole another separate video on effects and how that sound cancellation works with those speakers and how you know how effects work and you know what types of reverb you use and compression and all that stuff that's really important stuff today we're trying to get kind of an overview of what the sound uh, person reinforcement sound engineer world is. Yeah. Like, what is it that you do? Why are you there? You know, what would you say you do here? You know, like, what? <laughs> why are we so grumpy? Why? Yeah. And why are you so angry all the time? Yeah. Right. Yeah. All well, you do is just turn knobs yeah, and push faders. It seems really easy, buddy. You know, it really seems like anybody could do it, you know? Yeah. You're not, you're not entertaining people. You're not playing no. music. You're not a musician. Why are we even paying you buddy? To be honest, why are you taking part of our cut, man? You know, <laughs> Hey man, what do you do, Nate? What do you yeah. do? It's very important. It's a super I important your role. sound and I make it so thousands of people can hear it and appreciate it. Hopefully thousands more realistically dozens or a handful, but <laughs> no, yeah, like man. honestly, the, if, if people notice that you are there as a sound sound like a sound reinforcement engineer then you're not doing your job right mm. but if the focus is on the musicians and you you hear people say man that band is awesome god that was that was mm. the greatest concert i've ever been to you got to take then, silent pride like in inside then, pride then you're doing your job yeah. right like if you're if you want to be a sound guy because you think you're going to get a lot of praise and <laughs> you're, you're in it to, it, it, that's not, you're, yeah. you're the guy behind the scenes making, making everything go. Yeah. You, you're not going to get praise. And if you, then it's the wrong job for you if that's what you're doing. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to start a little something there. And I'd like to say that you may, probably will not get praise from the audience because you're right. If you're doing your job right, they're not going to know. They're going to just hear the band and they're going to love the sound of the band. But I would like to start something right now. uh, That is your musicians, the people that you're mixing us on stage as musicians, we should be very appreciative of the sound people and not only, you know, uh, behind the scenes and thanking them afterwards and all that stuff. We should be thanking them vocally on the mic and, and making sure that they get appreciation if they want that. Not all sound guys like to be called out like that necessarily, but you should find out what they like and what they're interested in. And you should bring them, uh, you know, Red Bull or, uh, or Funyuns or whatever it is that they want back there behind the, behind the mixing console, because it's important to keep that, 
because it's important to recognize that they are part of that sound. They're part of that experience. They're part of that performance. And they're a very large part of that performance, although they're not seen necessarily. It's very important that they're there and their role is very important. So making sure that we're thanking them and respecting them and, and being uh, aware and conscious of the contribution that they're making to our overall sound. It's very important, man. So I want to, I want to start that and throw that out there right now that you probably, <laughs> that. probably can expect to be ignored by the audience because that's like what happens other than a couple gear nerds will come up to you and you know, which oh, I, hey, man. yeah, I do that, man. You know, like, Oh, is that the CL whatever board this, you know, I mean, I like that stuff. I think it's fun, but, but as musicians, we should be very conscious of the role that the sound engineer plays. And it's a very important role. And they ultimately have control over whether you sound good or bad. So you start upsetting the sound engineer and pretty, pretty soon you're like, oh, man, did you hear that shredding solo? And the audience is like, nah. And the sound guy's like, because I muted you. You know, and it's like you got to be a little careful uh, because they have a lot of power, man, a lot of control. Well, yeah, I've most yeah vocalists i kind of have to read the riot act too i'm like mm. every vocalist i come in contact with i'm like don't you pull this diva stuff <laughs> yeah sure and i tell him i said i'll make your life absolutely miserable yeah it's I well said, within your power your best friend i will do anything for yeah you, sure but don't you start being you right know, being a jerk you start yeah. throwing an attitude with me right. because right. i will make your life a living hell it's easy to think as the vocalist or you know as the front person or someone who's been kind of on the front of the stage a lot of the time as i have talking to the audience and playing solos and that stuff it's easy for us to think that we are the center of the show it's easy for us to be like this is our show and we're here and it's it's kind of a reaction that you have and it's only through um humbling experiences and a lot of education that you realize that man, it's almost less about the front person than it is about everything else. The sound reinforcement, the bass player, drummer, lighting guy, the, the, the monitor person, the stage people, the equipment guy. I mean, it's almost the least about the person out in front and it's more about everyone else. And that's just something that comes with humbling experiences like that, where you go to a venue and you're the, you know, hot star and then all of a sudden, everybody's like, man, this sounds like trash. And you realize how important that sound engineer is. Or your mic isn't where it's supposed to be. And you realize how important the stage hand is. Or the bass doesn't drop when it's supposed to. And you realize how important the bass player is. And it's only through those humbling experiences that you can uh, realize, you know, this really is a community. It's really a team effort. It's really a group effort. Right. There's, there's no individuals on that stage or even in that venue. It's all one complete show or it's not. Well, right. And it, yeah, everybody has its role, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you don't have a drummer, you know, there's no yeah. like, it's hard to rock and roll without a drummer, man. <laughs> right. And, and like, if, if you don't have a bass player thrown down the groove, you're not going to want to yeah. get up and dance. Right. And then, yeah. you know, if you don't have that tall, sexy guitar player, oh man, you know, who would that be doing a thing? Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Man. Everybody yes. has its role. The, the engineer, you know, the sound engineer, it's like, you know, and I've always wanted to be, you know, and all my students that I teach, I'm like, be in rehearsal. Yeah. Be rehearsal. Be in the rehearsal with the band. One, because you feel like you're part of the band sure. and the band members feel like you're part sure. of the band and they're, yeah. you're building that trust. Yeah. You know, if you have the opportunity to have like a band, like I know in the Navy, you know, we usually we're together for a year or two years band right. stay together, but you know, sometimes audio engineers, you're just, you know, you, you take a gig like, Oh, Hey, right. I need a, like here in Virginia. Oh, Hey, I need an audio engineer, anybody available. And you don't yeah. get to build that repertoire. You have sure. like 30 seconds. Right. Right. To, to build that repertoire with your band. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's very but important it, to, if you can be there for the rehearsal, be there for the warm up, the sound check, whatever, you know, I mean, generally the sound engineer is there for the sound check, but try to build that relationship with the band. Try to make sure you know what their objective is. What do they sound like? What are you, what are you mixing for? Is it a heavy metal band or is it, you know, avant-garde jazz? Like, what is it that you're mixing? You yeah. know? Well, and that's what I'm, I'm so fortunate you know, the Navy has its issues. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> I'm, 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 so, <laughs> I'm so thankful for the opportunity that the Navy's given me because yeah. I've, I've mixed 
brass bands, rock bands, different versions of yeah. rock bands, rock bands with horns, yeah, rock bands with like I think when I first got to San Diego, there was two guitars, yeah a bass and drums and mm -hmm. vocalists and right. then you guys were singing background vocals and yeah then it switched and then a rock band with keyboards with yeah. one vocalist right so there's just so many different versions and then i've i've gotten to mix wind ensembles yeah uh you know um all that chamber experience group, chamber groups brass yeah. quintets woodwind quintets so, so valuable it, it's been a really very nice experience the you know, breadth of experience the the amount of things that you've gotten to do that's huge because you don't think you think i'm the best rock band mixer that there's ever been and i've mixed every rock band and every type of rock band but the experience that you gain from mixing a brass band you can be like oh you know that sousaphone filling in on bass i love those tones or this sound or that and you can take that and translate that to the rock band and yeah it's not a it's not a sousaphone it's not you know it's a bass guitar but you can know that sound. You can know a little bit different. Wind ensemble, how all of those instruments have to come together to make one single sound. Like the experiences are very transferable. Well, and that's, that's you know, anybody watching this that wants to be a sound engineer, my advice would be to just get your hands on not just drums, bass, and guitar, mm. but expand it. Get, listen to a trumpet. Listen yeah. to what the a French horn, an oboe, a bassoon, flute, any sort of instrument, even like a banjo or, you know, instruments that they use in different countries. Yeah. You know, there's, you can get online and you can find any sort of stem that people have recorded and you can practice on those things. And I would suggest doing that so that you get, when you do get the opportunity to mix that certain instrument, you know how to do it properly. Yeah. That brings up a uh, last uh, very good point and something I want to get to here before we uh, before we um, get going. It's been an hour already, so I really appreciate your time today. But if I am a young student or even an older student or somebody that plays an instrument and I, I want to start, you know, recording at home or I want to start mixing, I want to get into live sound and engineering. Where should I start? What kind of gear am I looking at? Who should I be listening to? Where can I get information about about that? And, and how should I start? You know what? Uh, start by. Uh, hmm. I would honestly, for home studio, you will you need a computer and you need software. Okay. You're gonna need a DAW. There's there's a few out there. I've worked in Pro Tools. I'm kind of making the switch to Logic Pro X because okay. I have Mac everything. Oh yeah. But Logic is really good. Um, uh, Reaper is a free program out there if you don't you know have a if money's tight your sure. budget's tight you can download reaper that's a that's a nice thing um and garage band too actually garage band comes yeah. loaded a lot on uh on on most apple things i think garage band comes right right and and garage band is a very good thing it's a, a very it's a very simple version kind of a watered down version of logic pro x yeah but you that can get you started and then again you're going to need an interface which mm and a microphone you're going to need some sort of microphone and okay. shore has a lot of a uh, lot of good information on their microphones but shore is kind of the standard okay but like uh sweetwater i'll put a shout out for sweetwater they're great any gear like if you're looking at a microphone they've got guys there like if you're looking at a sm57 you can scroll down like through the pictures and they'll have a video there and it'll talk about Oh, hey, well, this video, you know, this microphone gives you this. This is really mm. good on this. Okay. And YouTube can be your friend too. There's a lot yeah. of guys out there that are working with this gear. They'll give you reviews on okay. it. You just type in the model number and yeah. so start there. You know, you're gonna need a mic, you're gonna need a mic cable, you're gonna need an interface. Mm. And uh there's a lot of like uh Mackie makes some good stuff there okay. onyx preamps are really good mm. um behringer makes some good stuff entry level stuff um focus yeah. right okay focus right some really good stuff too. you have to have so something to start there's a mixing lot of entry on. stuff we have to have some kind of gear in order to be able to start mixing on that stuff and that's one of the right. things we want to provide at, that we do provide at school of rock is we have a full 
recording studio at School of Rock. So we have the ability for students to come in to learn on some basic smaller consoles, as well as learning on larger consoles. We have several different types of DAWs, the digital audio workstations that we talked about. So we're using Logic and Pro Tools. We also have GarageBand and uh, Reaper. So we're using a, a wide variety and Studio One actually as well. So we're trying to cover a lot of the bases so that we can get as much information um, and experience out there to our students as possible. So uh, you can buy some of these entry level units for a couple hundred bucks. You can get a nice Focusrite preamp in a package with a mic with everything you really need to start recording. And additionally, you can come uh, to us at School of Rock and we can show you all of that stuff in the beginning. So we can show you exactly what Nate's talking about here. We can show you how your gain structure works. We'll take you through some courses. And then we have the beauty of having Mr. Nate and also many other sound <laughs> engineers uh, that work with our school that we can point you in the right direction. Uh, if you're interested in film scoring and doing that kind of stuff, that a lot of that happens in the box, we can set you up with that information. If you're looking to do live sound, we have some wonderful instructors that can help you. And Nate has uh, generously offered to do some workshops and camps later on as well. So we'll have him back for that. And then as well as a recording studio uh, work as well. We have a recording engineer and we have myself that has a lot of experience with that as well. So we do offer programs in that, that we can get you started and, and, and point you in the right direction. Just like you're saying, uh, there are definite ways to start in the beginning and there's a lot of avenues to start with. So it pays, uh, pays off to have some advice and a little mentoring in the beginning to know where to go and, and how to start with that stuff. So appreciate your time, uh, today, Nate. Nate, thanks for joining me today, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, for sharing information uh, about sound engineers. I think now all of our students will go out to our venues and we'll be much more aware and conscious of our sound engineer brethren and sisterin, and uh, we'll be able to hopefully take a couple seconds to put maybe a half a smile on a sound uh, engineer's face because, boy, it's <laughs> tough to get those full smiles, you know. You got a good one right there. So yeah, there I'm, go. I'm doing my best. We've <laughs> known each other for a while. That's right, yeah. I, I do my best to to be respectful and to understand that. So I, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for sharing a little dive into the world of sound engineering and, um, and we'll have you back for some classes and some other things as well. If you want to check out uh, some of his work, it's he's working with the Navy band. Um, so we can get you some links. If you're interested, just send, uh, send me a direct message here at school of rock, Santa Ana, and we can hook you up if you have any questions or further things you'd like to ask for Mr. Nate. So thank you, sir. Appreciate you joining me and uh, we'll talk again next time. See Sounds ya. good. Right Appreciate on. it. School of Rock. Santa Anna.